So what I'm going to cover in the course uh, in this talk is some of the indications for this test. We'll go over the anatomy again because that's always helpful. Some of the pitfalls when you're trying to interpret this and some examples of pathology. So first of all, the indications. Well, the most common indication is obviously to look for a foreign body, for example, a fish bone or animal. And somebody's been eating and they come in with pain and difficulty swallowing. We also do still use it for enlargement of adenoids in children. And obviously, one of the more recent um, syndromes, Eagle syndromes, uh, the lateral soft tissue x-ray can be used to assess the length of the styloid bone. I've put epiglottitis and abscess there because in the past they were recognised in, uh, indications. However, with um, the advent of cross-sectional imaging, that's not relevant anymore. So I would say these are the three main indications. So first of all, the anatomy. Now, it's a lateral soft tissue x-ray and obviously we're concentrating mainly on the ENT aspect of it. However, you obviously do include the cervical spine. And so normally in the cervical spine, you should have what's called the lordosis. So like a, a, a curvature of the spine. So it's useful to note if the patient still has that. If they've lost that and it becomes more a kyphosis, so more a C, that could indicate that the patient has got some pain or there's something altering the position of their spine. So that's sort of a useful just thing to have in the back of your mind. And obviously this really comes from these pre-vertebral soft tissue measurements, obviously come from the cervical spine measurements, but are relevant if you're worried about a retropharyngeal abscess or collection. So we say above the C4 vertebra, so this is C2, 3, 4, you allow up to seven millimeters. And below the C4 vertebra, you, allow, you can allow up to 22 millimeters. So this is the anatomy that um, we're interested in, really, uh, from today's meeting. So about the level of C3, you should be able to identify the hyoid bone. So this is a bone and it's uh, the anterior aspect and you should see the body and you probably won't see the uh, lesser cornu very well, but you should be able to see the great cornu. And then also the anterior aspect of the image, you can see the thyroid cartilage. So this is ossified in this patient and therefore you can see it on the x-ray and so you've got the anterior aspect and the posterior superior cornu extending superiorly here and you just about see the cricoid cartilage which is the most inferior ossified cartilage which encircles the larynx and the retinoid cartilage is sit on top of the posterior aspect of the cricoid cartilage but they're probably quite difficult to identify really on a lateral soft tissue x-ray. So I've got this in a diagram and um, so we've got the hyoid bone here so here's the body and you've got the lesser cornu and the uh, greater cornu here and this is your thyroid cartilage and in between the hyoid bone and the thyroid cartilage, you have the uh, thyrohyoid membrane, which is an important structure. And if somebody comes in after hanging, this is probably the most important structure that you have to look for, because rather than the fracture of the hyoid bone, this um, structure can be deformed and, um, and can cause the patient difficulties. So, You've got your thyroid cartilage and your superior cornu and your inferior cornu. And the inferior cornu connects to the cricoid cartilage by the cricothyroid membrane. Moving on to the cricoid cartilage. So as I say, the cricoid cartilage is the only um, cartilage that sort of encircles the, the, the larynx and the retinoid cartilage just sit on top of it. And this is it here. I've inverted the image because it can sometimes be quite difficult to um, 
identify if I just showed you the uninverted image. So this is an 18 year old girl who swallowed a salmon bone and where are her most of her thyroid cartilage and where's her cricoid cartilage. So we can see her hyoid bone here and that hasn't fused. And you have these small foci of density in the region of her pharynx, but she hasn't ossified her thyroid or cricoid cartilages. And the ossification can vary um, and may not occur until people are in their 30s and complete ossification may not happen until people are in their 70s. So just be aware um, that this is why sometimes some of the imaging can look quite odd because things that should be there aren't there. So this is a 16 year old boy who came in after a rugby injury and came in with neck pain. So if I just point out these things here, he's in a neck collar because he's come in with a possible neck injury. So this isn't technically a lateral soft tissue x-ray, but just demonstrates some of the problems that people can run into. And you can see here, he's lost the normal lordosis of his neck. Now that could be, the likelihood is, is because he's in a collar and he's in pain. So that's the reason why it sort of becomes more a C curvature than uh, a lordosis. Now the radiographers can everybody mute themselves? Thanks. Um, so we can see the hyoid bone here and the radiographers have thought that this defect here is, is a fracture and therefore they've red dotted it. Now the patient went on to have an x-ray and a CT for their neck pain, not because of the hyoid bone, but fusion of the hyoid bone can again be quite variable and potentially never happen. But on the CT you can see you've got the body of the hyoid bone and the greater cornu and the lesser cornu here, but they're very well defined, these edges. So this is not a fracture. This is just non-fusion of the hyoid bone. And radiographers not infrequently do red dot things and you just have to be aware that this potentially could happen. And we won't worry about the hyoid bone because the type of injury the patient had was not, would not cause a fracture of the hyoid. And this is a nice 3D version. If you do see laryngeal calcification in children, conversely, that could be a, a sign of a potential autoimmune disease causing inflammation of the laryngeal uh, cartilages. So seeing dense calcification um, in children potentially could indicate um, some form of generalized autoimmune disease. So we move on to, so we've done the bony and ossified components. So we move on to the more soft tissue things that you could see on an X-ray. So we have the pharynx, you can see the tongue, you can just about see the epiglottis, and you can see the esophagus and the trachea. And this is what it looks like on a sagittal CT scan in the soft tissue plane. So you've got the soft palate here, you've got the tongue, you've got the epiglottis, You've got the esophagus here and you've got the trachea and up here you've got the pharynx. So one of the things that you have to be aware of is patient positioning and in children if they're crying they don't want to be imaged they can be ex in expiration you can see all of this abnormal soft tissue well it looks abnormal however when the child has stopped crying and they're not breathing in and out, you can see all the prevertebral soft tissues look normal. So the child doesn't have a large retropharyngeal abscess. In adults, 
if they happen to take a big swallow at the time when you take the radiograph, that can alter the prevertebral soft tissues. So then they've obviously swallowed at that point and you think, oh, this isn't following the seven millimeter rule. And here you can just see the tissues all look normal when they've repeated the study and the patient hasn't swallowed. So obviously we're not in the room and I can't see everybody's faces, but I would ask, is this normal or abnormal? And I'd hope everybody would say this is abnormal. So this is the C2 vertebral body here. And the rules state that the pre-vertebral soft tissue should be seven millimeters. However, there looks to be too much soft tissue in this region. And the vertebral body appears somebody's taken a bite out of it. And so this is the x-ray again, and this is a sagittal T2 weighted MRI. And you can see this abnormal signal, we call it, which is abnormal soft tissue, which is destroying that C2 vertebral body. And this was a metastasis from the patient who's had previous breast cancer. Again, this is another patient who came in problem swallowing. And if we look here, yeah, the soft tissues look fine. This is the cricoid cartilage here, and it just appears to be pushed forward. And th this is just too much soft tissue in front of these vertebrae. So there's increased free vertebral soft tissue. The patient went on to have an MRI, and this actually turned out to be a post cricoid tumor. So this is a post-concrast axial MRI, and this is the cricoid cartilage here, and this is the tumour just sat behind the cricoid cartilage. Okay, moving on to adenoids. So adenoids tend to be invisible until about six months of year, and then, the year, and then they regress after about six years of age. Now, if you don't see adenoids after six months, it could imply that the patient has some kind of immune disorder. So adenoidal hypertrophy, large adenoids could obstruct the eustachian tube leading to recurrent ear, ear infections. It could cause speech problems potentially if the child is becoming deaf due to repeated ear infections that could affect their speech and obviously if their nose is blocked, um, that could also cause speech problems. And because their nose feel blocked, they end up breathing through their mouth and that could affect how they eat, lead to snoring, which leads to sleep apnea, which could lead to right heart failure. And some papers mention you can get elongation of the middle face and a high arch palate. So this is a lateral soft tissue x-ray done to look at a child's adenoid. And it's not really size you're looking at, it's really how much um, the adenoids are Im impeding on the nasopharynx. Um, and actually there's apparently good correlation between nasendoscopy and uh, how the adenoids look on the lateral soft tissue x-ray. So in this case, the adenoidal soft tissue appears larger than the airstripe that you see within the nasopharynx. So the likelihood is this is fairly significant um, adenoidal enlargement. So this is the x-ray and this is how adenoidal hypertrophy looks on a sagittal T2 image. These are the abnormal soft tissue here and this is the CT of a different patient and you can see how enlarged these adenoids are. This is the hard palate and the soft palate and there's almost no stripe of air within the nasopharynx as the adenoids are so large. Fish bones. So this would be the most common uh, reason for requesting a lateral soft tissue best uh, x-ray. So as we've Previously learned, fish bones have variable opacity depending on species of fish. And there's the A&E book that says the visible uh, 
fish tend to be cod, haddock, coal fish, lemon sole and gurnard, and herring, kipper, salmon, mackerel, trout and pike are not visible. However, that is with plain film radiography. And that was a few, now a couple of decades ago, Gerald DeLacy, who was a radiologist in London, and he x-rayed all of the fish bones and came up with this. However, we have moved on and now we use digital radiography. And with digital radiography, we were able to window things a lot better. And so now all fish bones should be visible um, on a lateral uh, soft tissue x-ray. Now, interestingly, deep sea water fish, those who swim deeper in the water, they have reduced ossification of their bones, whereas cod, which apparently swims in more surface water, have more ossified bones. Um, so potentially cod is still slightly easier to see, but you should be able to see all fish bones. The difficulty you have is that the fish bones could be obscured by the hyoid bone or the ossified cartilages and potentially by any um, soft tissue edema that may be on the film. So this patient does have a fish bone. You just see that linear density there. But as I've said before, they can be obscured by soft tissue swelling and you may need to look for indirect signs um, and so prevertebral soft tissue gas or swelling. And so even if you can't see anything, if you're still particularly worried, you still need to interrogate the film for any other signs that the patient may have swall swallowed a foreign body. So this is an example of another fish bone, just to give you some examples. So at the level of the C5 vertebral body, and this is it in closer. So this is the hyoid bone here, and part of the cricoid cartilage is here, and you can just see the fish bone overlying cartilage there. And again, this is the hyoid bone, and you can see the fish bone within the pharynx there. Obviously CT does make it easier and the location of the bone is much more straightforward. So on this axial CT, you can see a fish bone in the right palatine tonsil and within the, the esophagus, this looks more like an animal bone. Um, so CT can make identifying the location of the lesion much more easy. Now this is a real case. So this patient came in having swallowed a, an animal bone, um, suddenly felt unwell. So as you can see here, she's lost her normal cervical lordosis and it's more a C shape. So indicating she's in pain and there's something, you know, affecting the way her neck is, um, is located. And you can see here, all of this abnormal soft tissue um, there's way too much prevertebral soft tissue here and her cartilage is pushed anteriorly and also abnormal areas of gas. So there's, she may have a significant retropharyngeal abscess and also extensive abnormal gas around her larynx and pharynx. And this is what the CT looked like. So this is an axial contrast enhanced CT. So the molecularly here and she's got this gas containing retropharyngeal collection and this gas extended into her upper mediastinum. And it was due to this chicken bone, which you can only just about see if you really mag up the X-ray. So this patient swallowed a chicken bone and you can see there's localized increased soft tissue, prevertebral soft tissue lower down the neck. And they went on to have a CT and this is the hyoid bone here and the superior cornu of the um, thyroid cartilage and there's abnormal 
soft tissue in the retropharyngeal region extending into the left side of the neck. And this is the thyrohyoid membrane and you can see whatever they have swallowed has penetrated the thyrohyoid membrane and there's gas going through it. And even further down within the neck, this is the cricoid cartilage and this is the thyroid cartilage. And this is a slightly off center retropharyngeal collection, which is going around the back of that thyroid cartilage into that lateral neck. And this is what it looks like on the coronal plane. So quite subtle findings on the X-ray, but quite large findings on the CT. So that's fish bones. So we're moving on to another lateral soft tissue X-ray. And I'm sure you've all spotted the thumb sign. I just thought I'd show a couple of images of epiglottitis, the supposed thumb sign. And this is what it looks like if you were to look down with a nasal endoscopy, but with the strep basically being uh, treated, we probably hardly ever see this anymore. And this patient came in after they thought they'd swallowed a fish bone and this was red dotted. So we've got the hyoid bone here and the radiographers thought this was a fish bone. I think it was reported as that as well. However, what was it? So it wasn't a fish bone. I've got axial soft tissue images here and I've got a 3D image here, what it was was their elongated styloid processes. So this is the parapharyngeal fat here and their styloid processes are continuing into it. And you can see that they're extending almost down to the angle of their mandible. So this is Eagle syndrome. So a lot of people will have elongated styloid processes However, not everybody will suffer with the adenophagia, the feeling that there's something in their throat, uh, the pain and discomfort um, with or without swallowing. So the actual syndrome is quite rare. Um, and it really depends if the patient is symptomatic. So it tends to be an elongated or deviated styloid process or calcification of the stylohyoid ligament. So the next question is how long is normal? So there's been lots of studies dating back to 1977, but the length I think I would use is about four centimeters. So if the styloid process is getting above four centimeters, then if the patient is symptomatic, then potentially this could represent Eagle syndrome. So take home uh, points is you have to review the whole image. So have to look at the bones as well as the soft tissue anatomy. Remember any pitfalls, because um, you've obviously know the clinical history, maybe the patient's taken a big swallow or if they're a child, they're crying. So the soft tissues may be altered. With digital radiography, all fish bones should now be visible and keep an eye out for any secondary complications, so prevertebral gas and prevertebral soft, uh, soft tissue swelling.